Hello, my name is Dr. Richard Whitlin. I'm an ophthalmologist who practices in New Brunswick, New Jersey, and we're going to spend the next hour talking about oral medications and their ocular side effects. Prescribing medications would be a simple matter if medications only did one thing which is what we wanted them to do. In reality, the medications get distributed throughout your body and they can have unintended consequences. It's essential for the prescribing doctor to know these things. However, not all MDs are aware of the ocular side effects of the medicine. Therefore, it really behooves us to be the ones looking out for these things. Major accumulation sites in the eye where systemic drugs get distributed include the cornea, lens, and vitreous. The cornea has a permeable endothelium. It also has stromal glycosaminoglycans, which bind drug molecules. Uh, the drug mo molecules themselves can bind to lens proteins. They photosynthesize the lens and produce cataracts. And lastly, the vitreous has a very low turnover, it's fairly inactive, and drug molecules tend to accumulate there. Melanin binding is also a factor. Melanin absorbs light and damage uh, and produces retinal toxicity. We're going to talk about this in more detail, but chloroquine and chlorpromazine have a very high affinity to melanin and so they tend to cause ocular side effects in the retina and choroid. Certain drugs, we know why there's ocular toxicity, other times we don't. For instance, um, sildenafil or Viagra, we know works by blocking hyperpolarization of the photoreceptors. That's how it produces the ocular side effect. And tamsulosin, or Flomax is an alpha-1A adrenergic blocker. We also have things where the metabolism of the drug gets uh, altered and the therapeutic window shrinks, especially in a setting where the patient has concomitant liver or kidney disease. It's also possible uh, that we're dealing with drug interactions, and we'll talk about that, but most of our patients take multiple medications. They're polypharmacy. Sometimes when people pull out their list of the medications, it's amazing to me they can actually keep it straight. Uh, also, finally, uh, the, the body's ability to metabolize a drug directly correlates with us, uh, its toxicity. Uh, and again, as I mentioned before, hepatic and renal disease, which usually detoxifies agents, in that setting, you're more likely to see toxicity. In terms of photosensitizers, the adult crystalline lens normally filters out most UV radiation. So in a normal situation, the retina is pretty much protected. Uh, UV radiation certainly can affect the external ocular tissues. You certainly can get a corneal burn. And the lens can be affected when it's photosensitized by bound drug molecules. The exposed lens proteins denature, opacify, and they accumulate, leading to cataract formation. UV radiation can affect the retina, especially in aphagic or pseudophagic patients because the ultraviolet radiation can penetrate without the normal absorptive lens barrier. Most modern IOLs contain UV blocking elements, but patients who have older generation lenses are at risk. So when we start talking about photosynthesizers, the ones that are well known to cause anterior subcapsular changes include medications like allopurinol, phenothiazine, amiodarone, and chloroquine. Steroids are catarogenic. Uh, we all know this. Uh, and we can see it both from topical, systemic, 
It's also been described with intranasal steroids. Uh, most typically, what one gets is a posterior subcapsular opacity. Later on, you also can get some anterior subcapsular changes. The exact relationship between the dose, duration, total dose, and cataract, form cataract formation is unclear, and it has never been fully elucidated. So there's no number you can say, aha, this is safe. My patient won't get a cataract. Um, however, studies sort of seen if you're on less than 10 milligrams of prednisolone or prednisone or the equivalent, and you've taken the drugs less than four years, you probably are not going to get a cataract. Um, so there's some obviously dose effect. And this is what it looks like, uh, central PSC. We don't know exactly why it affects that particular part of the lens, but other complications from steroids also need to be considered, including glaucoma, secondary ocular infections, corneal thinning and perforation, uh, the reactivation of herpes, and of course, steroids do delay wound healing. And as I said before, you could end up with a secondary infection. This was a case of fusarium keratitis um, in a patient who was immunocompromised from steroids. So as an example, let's take a look at this patient. Uh, this is a 75-year-old patient, one day post-op, uh, complaining of pressure feeling, 2060 vision, some corneal edema. The significant thing here is his intraocular pressure is 38. I get phone calls like this all the time, and people will sometimes say to me, well, should we switch the steroids? Because you really have three things that can be going on. There could be a choroidal effusion, which is why you have to dilate these patients and look. People are concerned there may be a steroid-induced rise in pressure or retained viscoelastic. And the point of this is that you don't get a steroid-induced rise of pressure in the first 24 to 48 hours. It's either going to be choice one or choice three. Much more likely, it's choice three. The surgeon just didn't get all of the viscoelastic out. Uh, children seem to be more susceptible to the catarogenic effect of steroids. Uh, if you notice, uh, especially in a child, uh, early opacities developing, if there's possibility of discontinuing the steroids or switching to some other type of immunosuppressant agent, the steroids effect may dissipate. Uh, you may find that the opacity stabilize or even potentially uh, regress. Other drugs that affect the lens, chlorpromazine. Uh, you get these yellowish brown granules uh, on the anterior lens capsule and usually it's within the pupillary space. This definitely is dose related. Uh, once you hit, exceed a thousand grams, uh, and this is again a, a medication that is taken on a chronic basis, 50% of the patients will have some lens changes and these deposits do not go away. And they'll look something like this as well. Um, other drugs that can cause cataracts include busulfan, uh, which is a agent used to treat leukemia, and gold, which is still used sometimes to treat rheumatoid arthritis. And again, most of the time in with gold, these opacities are not particularly visually significant, but will be seen in about half the patients who've been on gold therapy for more than three years. Uh, allopurinol uh, is another agent that also needs to be considered. Uh, it's commonly used to treat gout. Let's talk about statins. Uh, there's probably lots of people listening to this who are on a statin. They are the most frequently prescribed class of medications in the US in 2010, which is going back seven years, uh, 255 million prescriptions. 
uh, the guidelines for statin use continues to expand. Uh, and as cardiologists use risk calculators uh, to decide who gets it, uh, if the risk of a patient having a heart attack, a stroke in the next 10 years is greater than 7.5%, their risk calculators say lifestyle management, diet, exercise, put the patient on a statin and lower the cholesterol. I wonder if there's not a message here for us in terms of uh, glaucoma patients. Uh, somewhere down the road, we ought to have risk calculators, it seems to me, to decide which patients need to be treated and which ones can probably be safely followed. The common statins are as described. These are names that you should just be familiar with. Uh, statins produce a variety of side effects. Systemically, they can produce fatigue, muscle pain and weakness, rare circumstances, something called rhabdomyolysis, which is a breakdown of muscle tissue. And this produces liver and kidney failure and um, is a life-threatening big deal. You can get elevated liver enzymes, uh, you can get headaches and sleeping difficulties. From our point of view, the thing that we're concerned about is do statins cause side effects? When they first came out, I can remember patients being sent into the office for evaluations to see if they had cataracts. Uh, in general, we can tell our patients that statins do not increase the incidence of cataracts. The only really exception is if you're on statins plus erythromycin which may be relevant because uh, a lot of docs like to use Zithromax to treat short-term illnesses. And it seems to interfere with the metabolism by affecting the cytochrome P450 and inhibiting it. Other things that we get to see and we need to be aware of as eye care practitioners is that, again, this can have muscle toxicity. So you may have a patient presenting with diplopia or ptosis, ophthalmoplegia, and again, more likely if, it's, if the patient is concomitantly taking a macrolide antibiotic, something in the erythromycin family. Uh, it's also been described some retinal toxicity, uh, which gives an appearance of cystoid macular edema, but it's not real. The way you'd pick this up would be unexplained visual loss and you'd see this on OCT testing, and at that point you'd probably send the patient out to a retina specialist. Anticholinergic drugs, we all know, also have ocular side effects. Uh, commonly, these drugs are used uh, like scopolamine to treat motion sickness. Uh, they can produce dry eye, blurred vision, pupillary hemodriasis, and occasionally anisocoria. Dry eye is another very common side effect. Polypharmacy is a real risk factor for dry eye. 37% of adults in the United States take five or more systemic medications, not including over-the-counter medications or any supplements that they may take. Of the 100 most commonly prescribed medications, 24 of them specifically list dry eyes as a potential side effect. There are multiple mechanisms for drug-induced side effects from decreased tear production to uh, a toxic effect on the ocular surface by the drugs being excreted in tears. Uh, the more drugs, the more drug interactions, the more ocular toxicity. Uh, we don't understand uh, all the drug interactions, and as and as a result, uh, patients receive their medications from multiple different doctors. Uh, the drug interactions are not always detected. Oftentimes, the pharmacist is the one who is the stopgap safety factor and will pick it up. But just be aware of the fact that our patients take a lot of stuff that can cause dry eyes. And you'll get a picture that looks something like this, this diffuse uh, SPK. So the most common offenders in terms of producing drug-induced dry eye 
are antihistamines, decongestants, uh, which patients can get over the counter or our chronic allergy patients will have, hormone replacement therapy with estrogens, uh, certain GI meds, these are in the class of proton pump inhibitors, so those are in the setting of GI disease and ulcers, and antihypertensive medications, especially beta blockers. And